so good afternoon. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. I feel like uh, I have to justify that a little bit. I, I say over 23 because the number is 24, uh, but it sounds really grandiose. Uh, over, over, over 23. Um, so, building modern composable business solutions. I, I, I'll start off by saying that uh, I feel incredibly fortunate to be here. Uh, I, I speak at a lot of events, but but this one being the the developer conference for communications uh, makes uh, me feel at home because uh, by trade, by schooling, by who I am, I'm a developer. Uh, I grew up uh, writing code, uh, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so as, as uh, was mentioned, I am the principal analyst at Forrester that covers web and mobile development, and that's uh, front to back, top to bottom. Uh, I, I cover front end development. Uh, middleware stacks, how do you get access to your data, uh, and, and all of these things. And, and for a long time when I did that professionally, we built technology because folks just bought technology. You were a Java shop, we built Java stuff, and you bought it. You were .NET, same thing. Uh, but the world has changed, and, and, and the world is changing right now very, very quickly. And, and a lot of that change was detailed by Jeff and, and, and folks at the keynote this morning. Uh, but uh, I'm here to talk about how we do that, how we actually build these composable modern solutions. Now, oftentimes these, these solutions today are built on, on mobile devices. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a lot about mobile, but, uh, but, but a lot of what I'm gonna talk about applies equally to the web, uh, applies to the upcoming IOT. I've got, to, I've got to put the word IOT in here like five times to meet my buzz criteria. But um, uh, they'll, they'll apply there as well. And so, uh, so let's jump into that. So I'll start it off with this quote, which I absolutely love. If you've heard, heard me talk before, you've probably heard this. Uh, uh, but any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. When I was a kid, I sat and, 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 and watched TV one night. Uh, and David Copperfield got on the TV, uh, and this is back when we only had one TV, and so we all had to watch it. Uh, he got on TV and made the Statue of Liberty, Liberty disappear. I grew up on a farm. Seeing the Statue of Liberty was, it was an awesome thing. Like, you know, it meant so much, had symbolism and things like that. And he made it disappear, and I was like, holy cow, that guy is amazing. And just like the, the, the feeling of awe inside of me was, was incredible. And I was sitting there with my mom and I looked at my mom and my mom was a banker and she understood the value of, of money and how money could potentially make your life better, at least a little bit easier. And I looked at her and she could see the look in my eye and she had the fear of what I was going to say. And I said it, I said, mom, I want to be a magician. <laughs> and to this day, I, I remind her of that. And she's like, I was, I was honestly worried that you were, that you were serious. Uh, but the great thing is, I got my wish. Because if you think about it, if, if, if we were to go back in time, way back, like three years ago, maybe even four years ago, if I were to give you a device, a phone, and said, if you touch this three or four times, a pizza might show up. Or if you touch it three or four times and hold it the right way, a cab might show up. And you don't have to go out and wave or do anything. It'll give you its license plate number and a guy's name, and he'll open the door for you. You don't even have to give him money. He'll just take you places. And, you know, after this, I'll do that. And I'll get in the Uber, and it'll take me to the airport. I don't even have to give him any money. It's just magic. Uh, I love that magic. But the very, very cool thing is what we're creating, very, very, what we're creating today, what we're creating tomorrow uh, in the very, very near past, looks like absolute magic. And that's what really, really excites me about, uh, about what's going on. But important to this crowd and, 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 and what we're all here for is how do we actually succeed with our customers? How do we actually get them excited and engaged with what we're doing? And I'll take you through a quick piece of uh, history. You know, we've gone through a number of ages uh, in, in business. We had the age of... of of, uh, of manufacturing when we were just trying to build things. In the age of distribution where we took those things and distributed them as far as we could, as far as we could go to make more money. Then we had the age of information, which is kind of where I jumped into this game professionally, which the web came along and, and, and that was the kind of the definition of how we did it, was we built things on the web. And, and now we are in what us at Forrester call the age of the customer. And the age of the customer means we need to be obsessed about what our customers want 
and give them what they want, when they want it, wherever they are. You hear us talk about mobile moments, and, and, and mobile moments are when I'm out in the world and something happens and I need something, I just had a wreck and I need my insurance information, or a cop just pulled me over and I need my insurance information, or I'm buying a car and I go to a dealership and I know these guys are doing some shady stuff and I need to find out what are the real numbers. That's the mobile moment. You have to be right there. So how do you do that? How do, if, 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 if you do that, you'll drive great success within your customers. But how do we do that? How do we build that? So that's causing a number of changes in, in technology. And it's uh, layered out into, into three things, what we're building, when we're building it, and, and, and how we do so. So I'm going I'm to walk us through here. So what we're building, what defines success today with what we're building? So I'll take you back. When I started building software professionally, at least getting paid to build software, uh, back in the very late 90s, uh, this was what success looked like. Uh, and no offense to the National UFO Center. Uh, I'm, they do awesome stuff, I'm sure of it. Um, but uh, this is what success was. It was how much stuff can we jam onto a page? We said we have these things in our data center. We have this, these applications, these sets of data. If we put it all on one page, if we can fit it all on one page, that's a win. That, we're done. Like pro product managers, that's blazing success. And then as we went further, we had the, the first wave of mobile. And, uh, and this is what I was actually hired to do out of college back in 99 was to build mobile apps on Palm Pilot and Pocket PC and Windows CE. Uh, and, 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 and funny aside, now, now at my job at Forrester, folks call me, uh, our clients call me and say, you know, mobile development is really hard. And I say, I agree, but that. It's crazy hard. We had one thread to do everything. And everything meant, you know, contacts, phone, and calendar. And that's it. Good luck building anything else. But when the first wave of mobile came out, we said, we have this new device. We can do all these new things. But success looked exactly the same. It was, how much stuff can we jam in there? I don't care how big your fingers are. We'll give you a stylus. That'll solve the problem. But how much stuff can we jam on a page? Today, success looks completely different. As Waze says, there's a better way. Success in today's digital world, in both mobile, and we're seeing mobile influence the web now as well, is how do we present just what our customers want, just when they want it, and then get out of the way. That's what success looks like today. So if that's what success looks like, what's changing about how we build it? So this is the biggest one, and I, and I as a developer, uh, it, when you meet developers, one thing about, about us is that we always, that's always in our head. As Jeff was talking about this morning, we're builders. Uh, and, and, and so anytime we see a problem, we see a challenge, we figure out how do we solve that? How do we build it? How do we, and so uh, I still write code, and, and this, is, this is a challenge that makes me really, really happy I get to stand on stage here today and not actually build these solutions. Because the time frame in which we're being asked to deliver solutions is, is uh, decreasing dramatically. Uh, back in the day, way back, like at least three or four years ago, uh, we had roughly 12 to 18 months to, to build internal enterprise solutions. We had a very waterfall procedure to do it. It was very prescriptive. The design folks did their thing, then developers, and testers, and ops folks. And it was very, very detailed. And, and we did that all over 12 to 18 months. And for a developer, that was great because it, when it wasn't your time, you did like professional development, which meant like play Warcraft or, or like go have long lunches and hang out. And then development time came and it was forced March and we worked for 80 hours a week. And, and that was good because we're cool with that. Uh, and then, uh, then once that was done, we gave it to the testers and they broke our stuff and they broke our beautiful creation. And that's why developers and testers don't get along. But um, uh, what we're seeing is a, is a massive change in that time frame. So we're going from a 12 to 18 month traditional cycle to now where business and customers uh, and stakeholders want to see apps, websites in two to four months. And then if we take that to the, to the extreme, if, if we listen to what, uh, to, to what Werner talked about this morning and how often Amazon ships and how often Amazon updates, Software development is approaching a zero-day event. It's, it's approaching to the point where when the business comes to development teams or, or IT organizations and says, hey, can you get this thing done? 
uh, in the first question, which is commonly asked, which is, well, when do you want it? Uh, I remember that answer always being, well, if we could have it today. And they would laugh, and, and I would laugh, and they'd get a little chuckle. Well, well, well now, moving forward, they're going to say we want it today, and they're going to be serious. Because if you can't deliver that today, folks go elsewhere. The amazing thing that we're seeing in mobile and is now pervading backwards into the web is there's a ton of choice. Folks have choice of where to go because the barrier to entry to creating software is incredibly low now. There's so many awesome opportunities out there to put things together to create amazing experiences. So we know that we have to have a great experience to win in today's world, but we're being asked to do that incredibly fast. So this is the first two big changes. The, the, the third one that we're seeing is, is how we do development. As I said in the past, we would, we would often look at what's our data look like? How much data do we have? What do our applications look like? Uh, okay, we have all this stuff, then let's put that out there. And if we put it out there, then everybody will use it and they'll love us. Uh, but the problem is, that's not very customer obsessed. Looking at our data and asking what our data can do on the web or in mobile uh, is a lot different than asking what our customers want. So we have to change that mindset. We have to, we have to change how we go about thinking up, designing, and developing software. We've got to start top down. Uh, at Forrester, we talk a lot about our systems. We have systems of record. The systems of record are back-end systems, our data, our ERP, our ugly, ugly back-end stuff that we would prefer that people don't see. Uh, then we have our systems of engagement, which is the great user experiences on top of that we, that we do want folks to see. We've got to think about building top down. Start with your systems of engagement. Start with what your customers want. And then start to federate in, OK, now how does the data fulfill that need? How do new systems of automation, beacons, uh, continuous input systems, how do they influence how that data fills in our systems of engagement? And then finally, use what we call systems of insight, predictive measures, uh, data-driven solutions. How do we use those to fully personalize exactly what people want? If we do it in that process and we always keep our customer first and keep their needs first, we have a much better chance of succeeding with the solutions that we build. In the past, it was a complete crapshoot. We had data and we threw it out there and maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't, but back then there wasn't choice. Back then, you, had to, you only had one or two solutions, so you like it or you don't. If you don't like me, this guy's probably marginally better, marginally worse. And so, but today, choice uh, changes this whole equation. So how do we do this? We have to create great experiences. We have to do it right now. And we have to do it with our customers in mind. So to solve this, I believe, we believe at Forrester, based on our discussions with our, with our customers, uh, with the folks that we talk to, that composition is the future. We simply don't have time to build software line by line anymore. We have to look at what's exist, what, what exists out there and simply compose solutions for our customers. And those, those solutions have to be flexible. They've got to be able to be changed. They've got to be changeable. Um, uh, I think Werner talked about this morning about being adaptable. These solutions have to be adaptable because customers' needs change every single day. I don't know about, about you, but when I wake up in the morning and I look at my phone, I see all these new updates on my phone. And that makes me think, oh, I'm going to use those apps. And so I have this mindset, there's always new stuff every day. So then we get into a mindset, well, every app I use should be new every day. And then, you know, Amazon updates 117 times per second or something like that. And, and I think, wow, everything should be new. And so when it's not new, I get this mindset of like, well, what are you all doing? Just sitting around, you know, waiting for some magic to happen. Uh, and that's, from a developer perspective, that's a terrible, terrible mindset because, you know, it's the constant race. But, but that's the world we live in now. So we've got to compose solutions. So then it comes down to, well, where can we compose? Where, where does this composition happen? Uh, and, and, and the big areas is happening on both the front end and the back end of these software systems. So on the front end, we have things like the web component spec in, in, in HTML that, that, that says, don't just write pure HTML and pure CSS and pure JavaScript. Instead, take pre-built components or almost pre-built components that are 
configurable uh, to a degree, and stitch them together. I remember it wasn't too long ago, I was uh, looking for some solution somewhere and I came across uh, Yahoo Pipes. And Yahoo Pipes I thought was this amazing thing. It said, I don't have to build anything. I simply connect this one service to another service to a UI and it magically happens. Well, the web wasn't quite ready back then, but it is now. We have, web browsers have power. Uh, the web browsers on our phones have power. And all of a sudden they can make a number of connections pretty quickly apply styling to it through CSS, as long as you don't write too bad CSS, uh, and, and, and create a really, really unique personalized solution. So web components, as you see the, the, the four parts of it on the left, uh, Google's Polymer is a great example, uh, a great initial example of web components and, and how that can be used. So essentially you can drag and drop pieces of the web together to dynamically create your solution. And if I can drag and drop pieces together, that means I can probably also programmably do it and if I can do it programmatically, uh, I can use data to influence what that looks like, and so I can always be personalizing to exactly what my customers need. But it's not only on the front end. Traditionally, backends were built with this very model view controller type uh, paradigm. Uh, so in, any of you folks that are, are computer people are very familiar with MVC, which said the model is your data, the view is your view, what you look at, and the controller is that which puts the two together. Well, that traditionally is very, very monolithic, very big. That's being broken up as well, and we're starting to compose on the back end. We're, we're, we're separating the model, the data, from the controller, from the application, using technology such as Node.js, very, very popular, growing rapidly in popularity. We'll talk about that in a second. We're disintermediating the controller, the application, from the view using a ton of things, literally every day new stuff, Angular, Ember, Ionic, uh, all of these things coming out to, to, to make your views amazing, dynamic, but separating it from the application that creates that view. So we can compose on the front end, we can compose on the back end. Now this is the interesting thing. So we can compose, we have this awesome opportunity to quickly build software by composing it, not writing it. But where do we do it and who does it? Because I'll tell you right now, all of us sitting in this room with mobile phones uh, or tablets, and I'm hoping that's everybody. If you're here and you don't have a phone or a tablet, whew, you're probably wondering what I'm talking about. But um, uh, right now, you are composing your own solutions. I don't know about you, but when I need to book a flight, I tend to pull up my Delta app, and I, I look and I see, okay, I think this flight will work, and here are the seats it's presenting me with. I'm a big guy. There's a lot of seats on a plane I don't fit in. So I use a site called uh, Seat Guru uh, to figure out which are the good seats. Well then, so what I have to do is I have to close the Delta app and then pull up the Seat Guru app and I look, okay, that's a good seat and I go back to the Delta app and oh, um, but it's, there's not an open seat next to it. Here's a better seat and I, I go back and forth and then if I book the flight and I need to change something, then I have to pull out my, my Delta uh, card and call them. There's all this thing, all I wanna do is book a seat. And that's one experience that Delta or the other airlines would love for me to do. They, they, that's how they get revenue. But it's difficult today because I have to compose my own solution to all of that. We need to do one step better. And, and we're starting to see early experiences of that. So, so with what we have today, with this app-centric model and web-centric model that we have, we're asking your customers to compose themselves. The next step is what we're calling embedded experiences. And we're, and we're starting to see sparks of this. Things like Google Now, Siri, uh, Microsoft's Cortana, uh, where the devices themselves take a look at what I, as a user, am doing and look at my calendar and look at things I might want to be doing, looking at my context, as Jeff talked about earlier. Take a look at my context and figure out for me the things that I should do. Stitch together the, ex the experience. Give me some cards in the Google Now uh, sense that solve my mobile moment, that solve exactly what I need. And I'll tell you, I use this quite a bit already. Going back to that Delta example, I actually never open their app if I don't have to, because I'd much rather just pull up Google Now and find out, here's the gate you're at. Oh, your flight's been delayed. Here's when it's going to take off. Here's when it's going to land. And oftentimes that data that Google gives me is more accurate than that which the provider gives me. 
But that's what I need. I can quickly see the information, get in, get out, have my problem solved, and then go and, I don't know, look at the CNN thing at the airport, because that's the only time I watch CNN. Um, but uh, these embedded experiences are, are, are the next step in composability. They are helping you compose that solution for your customers. But what we ultimately want, we want you, each of you, to be able to compose the solution for your customer exactly when they want and give them exactly what they want. And this is also very, very early. We're starting to see this with, uh, in the Asia Pacific market with WeChat. WeChat is a, is a platform that folks are building apps on top of such that they can have a full set of experiences right within WeChat. Facebook uh, announced a couple weeks ago, actually now probably about a month ago, that I can now start to build apps on Messenger. Facebook, when I want to have collaboration, allows me to pop up that little like floating head thing. Uh, and I can not interrupt the things I'm doing by talking to that little floating head and then just touching it and it goes away. It doesn't completely context, me switch, context switch me away from what I'm doing. It's the, the very early, definitely not a final solution, but it's that type of model. Don't distract me, don't take me away from what I'm doing because as brands, if you have a composition that takes them away from your app or your website, there's always a chance that they don't come back. And that's exactly what you do not want. So then how do we build it? How do we go about building these things, building these compositions? Um, first thing, this is, when, when I think back to how we've traditionally built software, uh, we always started out with a set of requirements. And that list of requirements was, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 things long. Um, and, and who came up with those requirements? It was folks like this, uh, and, and I can say that because I used to be a part of that. I didn't have quite that level of gray hair. I'm quickly getting there. But um, we would go up and go in a room and, and sit around and think, okay, we're going to build some software. Here's the 80 things we came up with. And we knew, we knew that's exactly what, we didn't even have to ask you what you wanted. We knew what you wanted. We wrote it all down in a massive tome of text. We gave it to developers and said, build this and it'll be amazing. And once you're done building it, we don't even need to ask if it was amazing. We know it was. We didn't even ask you if it was awesome. Unfortunately, that didn't work very well because every now and again, one of us would come in contact with a customer. Uh, I, I was one of those engineers that IBM allowed out of the, out of the lab and talk to customers. And, and those weren't, weren't always good experiences. Uh, they would tell me what they thought of our software at times, and it wasn't always pleasant. So we need to switch from this very requirements-driven development life cycle to a feedback driven life cycle. If we think about the, 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 the lean minimum viable product model, that's what we need to build. And so how do we do that? We need to define what the success criteria is for our customer for this event, for this thing that we're trying to solve. Define what we're trying to, to, to solve at a high level. Not define, not define requirements, but define what we're trying to solve. Establish the success criteria, the performance, criteria, et cetera, and then build just the core of what solves that problem. Build just that core. And why? Because we can do it quickly. We can throw analytics in there. We can get feedback. And we can immediately know if that solves our problem. We can immediately know if our customers like it. Because oftentimes, what we think they'll like, mm, sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it completely wrong. But you've got to know quickly. We've got to be able to fail fast. If we, if we, if we take 18 months and then fail, we all lose our jobs. That's not going to happen. You know, we, 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 we can't have that anymore. I got kids I got to feed. Then we need to quantify that feedback. So how quickly can I get this minimum viable product out there that can collect feedback and then quantify that feedback? One of the major challenges that we have as developers is we'll be, we, we, we know we're supposed to write. We start writing it. And then all of a sudden, folks will come to us, executives, customers, others will come to us and say, wouldn't it be nice if? And then whatever happens after the if, is what we call scope creep. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just add this one thing? Wouldn't it be nice if, if this button was moved to a different place? Well, if we quantify the feedback we get from our customers, we can simply look at that and say, if we did that, what changes? And then all of a sudden, we can have a very data-driven process in how we build these modern applications, how we compose what our customers need. And then finally, once we have that quantified, we align it with the success criteria that we laid out earlier, and then rinse and repeat. 
And that rinse and repeat model means that we didn't come up with an idea, build it, ship it, and we're done. Solutions today are very iterative. They tend to go on and on and on. That model earlier where I talked about waking up, looking at my phone and seeing all those updates, this is why. We've got to, we've got to continue with that mindset. So now with that in mind, what this does is this brings us a lot closer to our customers. And that's great. We want to know what our customers want. We want to know if we succeeded in meeting what they want. But I'll warn you, they'll tell you. They'll tell you if you did a good job. And so, you know, I went and took a look in app stores uh, just to see, you know, a random selection of feedback of what people tell us. Um, you get feedback like this. I use it all the time. It's very simple and clear, highly recommended. Yes, as a developer, I see that. I'm like, this is awesome. See, I met our needs. We met our customers' needs. This is awesome. Then we see stuff like I just downloaded and less than one minute later, I'm uninstalling. The developers are complete idiots. Yikes, complete idiots. That's, that's, that's harsh. I, I got a degree. I'm not an idiot. We say things like, please, please, please allow an option that, that allows both buttons to be moved to the right side of the screen. That's exactly what you want. You want them to say exactly these type of things. I'll move it. It's quantifiable. We succeed. And then there's the really, really painful stuff, like do not download this. P.S. If you don't fix this, I'm going to send out buttloads of hate. I mean it. That's tough to hear. I don't even know how much a buttload is. It's like a box of hate. <laughs> that, that, that's not a good day. So you're going to get a lot closer to your customers. Be prepared because that customer feedback isn't oftentimes what we're used to hearing on a day-to-day -day basis. So then to wrap this up, what do we need to do to win right now? Number one, understand the modern business technology platform. Understand uh, what we're needing to build uh, around this. And so um, I, I recently put out a, a report on what that platform looks like. Number one, uh, be very data-driven. Analytics is critical. I do not believe in building any software that does not have analytics built into it. We, are, we have so much opportunity to get data, especially with mobile devices. You have so much opportunity to understand the context of your user, what they're doing, where they're doing it, what other things they're doing, what mood they're in based on how much the device moves and things like that, we're, we're, we're really starting to understand. And as we get into things like the Apple Watch and others, uh, we, can, we, we see so much more. Don't lose that opportunity. So analytics has to be, has to be central to everything that you do to know what your customers want. Uh, the second thing is a cloud delivery model. Uh, especially in mobile, if you're successful, all of a sudden you're gonna see strange spikes in when people use things. And oftentimes those come from known events, things like Black Friday, you know, will we'll, we'll spike e-commerce apps, or, or tragedies will spike apps and, and folks that respond to those tragedies. Uh, so you don't want to have servers sitting around just waiting for that to happen that you pay for and they don't do anything 99% of the year. A cloud delivery model makes this happen. But unfortunately, it's not as easy just taking what you have and putting it up in the cloud. We kind of have to rethink how we build software to work in the cloud. Very, very microservice driven, very API driven, uh, a lot going back to what Werner talked about this morning. The third thing, identity. Uh, Mark Benioff over at Salesforce has said this many times, and I'll, I'll steal from him, that this isn't a mobile revolution, this is an identity revolution. We've got to know who our customers are and treat them as a human. So many times that we build software, we treat our customers as user IDs or UUIDs. And that changes on my phone versus my tablet versus the web. I cannot stand that. When I go to a, 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 an e-commerce uh, or, or a retailer and I log in and it seems like I'm a brand new person, yet I use their mobile app all the time, that infuriates me. And it's, it's, a, it's simply understanding that I am one person no matter what channel I am, I'm on. So federate identities and, and, and understand how to do that and have security around them. Uh, and then finally, have a consistent data access level, uh, a, con a consistent data access layer. APIs and, and creating a well-defined set of consumable APIs is critical to speed and critical to time to market. Your front-end developers, whether they be web developers, mobile developers, IoT, watch, wearables, glass, HoloLens, whatever they're on, and, and I can keep talking about that list, you know, the, the front end channels that we're, we're not slimming, we're, we're expanding. 
Those front-end developers don't care what the schema of your back-end looks like. They don't care what your HR systems look like. They don't care what your WSDLs look like and your web services and your SOA. They just want data. So make it easy. Make it easy for them to get that data, whether it's your internals, whether it's third parties, whether it's business partners or even externals. Make it easy to get that data. RESTful APIs, consistent, consumable RESTful APIs. And I'm sure the folks at Twilio uh, would agree because this is what's really, really benefited them, how easy it is to consume their service from a developer perspective. It's simply an API call away. Leverage that internally as well. Um, I, and, and when it comes to that, when it comes to how we create these consumable APIs, and, and, and keep in mind, when it comes to, to, to composition, Consumable APIs is the way that composition happens. So let's stitch some API APIs together to create an experience. This is what it looks like these days. Most every scalable performance solution out there, from Netflix to PayPal to Walmart and on and on and on, looks just like this. It's at, at its core, Node.js being the, the orchestration engine for all of these services or all these data touch points, front-ended by a web server more and more often Nginx because it also performs at that same level of scale. And so what this does is, is we're not actually ripping and replacing our existing infrastructure. We're simply layering Node on top and allowing Node and Nginx working together to be the orchestrator of all of this backend data, orchestrator of new microservices, orchestrator of data that you have maybe behind your ESB or in your SOA infrastructure already. Orchestrate these third party, new third party services like Twilio and Box and Salesforce and on and on and on, all of these new services. And what this allows me to do is as new services come around, really cool ones like we heard about this morning, as these new ones come around, I don't have to take my website offline and, 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 and rebuild it. I simply add in that new API, add in a new piece of user interface to expose that data and we magically have uh, a new experience that meets our evolving customer need. Uh, and so as a, as a real world example of this, of who's using it, uh, Black Friday of this past year, Black Friday, uh, as most of you are aware, is uh, the biggest e-commerce uh, or the biggest overall commerce day of the year. Um, we saw tweets like this from, from, from Best Buy saying that, uh, uh, we know we're having problems uh, with our website. Best Buy's website actually went down for an hour uh, on Black Friday. I don't even want to know how much money you lose as a website when you go down for an hour on Black Friday, but it's probably more than my check. Um, but they went down for an hour and they, they sent out a tweet that says, maybe you should try the web, or sorry, maybe you should try our mobile site. Phew, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a tough solution. After the fact, after they'd had, uh, you know, figured out, got the website back up, they issued a statement that said uh, th this was the problem. It was a concentrated spike in mobile traffic, triggering issues that led us to shut down BestBuy.com in order to take proactive measures to restore full performance. I read that and think, why do I care? I just want to buy stuff. When I needed you, you weren't there for me, so I probably went somewhere else. That is not the definition of customer obsession, and that is not how you'll succeed in this modern world where there's so much choice. We want to be solving problems, not solving ways to wordsmith our way around them. And not to be offensive to Best Buy, there were a lot of folks that had the same problem. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we have Walmart. So back in 2011, Walmart had the same problem. Walmart's site went down under the, under the weight of Black Friday in 2011. They went back and said, we need to rethink how we do things. We need to re-architect. And they re-architected in a way that looked like that Node plus Nginx uh, architecture I showed a little bit earlier. And so on Black Friday this year, they put out this tweet. Uh, one of the admins uh, of their, on their back end said, I haven't seen a response time over eight milliseconds. So we might release Chaos Monkey. So we might put new things out there. We might do some more tests right in the middle of Black Friday. Hashtag node BF, node Black Friday. Every one of their uh, transactions, 100% of Walmart's transactions on Black Friday went through their node infrastructure. Why? Because it scales and it performs at scale. It's as simple as that. So number two, we've got to invest in modern skills. To build these things, it's not your standard old school C, C++ and Java. There's a lot of new skills that come around. 
Uh, I take calls every day from clients and they're asking me, uh, who do I need to hire? Do I need to hire jQuery developers? Do I need to hire Node developers? Do I need to hire Angular developers? And in reality, what you need to look for is the commonality across all of these. And the commonality is that JS. JavaScript development skills are incredibly important. I've not been more bullish about a language in quite some time, probably since Java. Now the problem is Java and JavaScript share the front four letters, and that's a little bit uh, challenging because they're not really that common. Uh, it's, 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 more than a, um, it's more than a new set of semicolons. Java and JavaScript are different in how we think about writing code. So that's why I say don't look for the best Angular person or the best Ember person. Under, get someone that understands JavaScript and how to think like JavaScript. Think event-driven, asynchronous architectures and how I handle things with event handlers and how I handle things without having context of objects around me. It's a different way of thinking, but it's a critical skill as we move forward because so many of these solutions are built using these technologies. And number three, uh, compose your customer's solution. Compose, not write code. And, and, and as a former developer, that hurts a little bit because whenever we saw a challenge, we would just start writing code. That's, that's what we do, it's how we solve problems. But we have to understand what that challenge is figure out exactly what they need, and look around to see if there are already components out there. And there are a lot. If you, if you use things like Node, oftentimes it's one command line instruction away to get all of those things. I can compose it and have something ready today. If you don't, if you start writing code and take all that time to write code, somebody else will compose that and will solve that problem. The barrier to entry for software-driven solutions is incredibly small today. Know your customer know what they want and address that mobile moment. Address what they need when they need it. And then finally, use data, always. Use data to personalize their ideal composite solution. And one thing I didn't put up here, if you can, don't make them compose it. Really understand their needs and compose it for them. If they need to talk to one of your folks in a, uh, in a call center or one of your folks in the office, put the collaboration in there. If they need a map, don't make them go to Google Maps, put the map in there. So many times, actually, I don't live in San Francisco, I live in Boston, uh, but this is essentially a second home of mine. I use the Order Ahead app every time I'm here because I love that. It tells me where the best Thai food is no matter where I'm at. Um, what I would love is when I'm done ordering that it would show me the map or show me directions of how to walk there because uh, this is an awesome chance to get some good exercise while being out here, so I always want to walk. But I then have to look, do my order, and then get the address and then go to Google Maps or if my laptop isn't dead, I pull that up. And, and once again, I'm composing. Don't force your customers to compose. Give it all to them in one place. So finally, I'll end with this. Uh, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Out here, what, you know, out in the valley and out in the bay, I get the kind of front end of that uneven distribution. I get to talk to you folks that are, uh, that are doing amazing things, and I get to then take that back and uh, and, and, and help our other clients out to, to get to that same level. But uh, I, I put this up here because so many of my phone calls at Forrester start with the same phrase. I know I'm behind, but. I know I'm behind the other folks in my vertical, but. You're not. You're not. Every conversation starts that way. But the good thing is there's so many tools, so many opportunities, so many chances to compose and to meet our customer's need uh, and really accelerate uh, how we uh, excite uh, and engage our customers. And with that, I will say thank you.